This video is sponsored by Nebula. Nineteen sixty-eight's Night of the Living Dead by George A. Romero is one of the first horror movies to ever include a truly black heroic lead. There had been black characters in horror films before then, but black characters in the 30s and 40s horror era were solidly in the spook archetype. Think Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Scared, wide-eyed, stumbling fools meant to add some levity to the storytelling. They didn't die often, but they also didn't have any dignity, which is why Romero's film was so impactful. Played by Dwayne Jones, the character of Ben was a subversive piece of casting, a black hero among a mostly white cast who makes it almost all the way to the end of a sudden zombie uprising until the racist police shoot him. Okay, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the fire. Romero has said that Jones was chosen for the role because he was simply the best. And while that is clearly true in the performance, him being black changed the dynamic of the story. The subtext is present when you watch the film. Even today, we are aware of how it looks for a white woman to be scared by a black man who is trying to help her. To have a white male figure try and take over and pontificate over Ben, even though he clearly knows what he's talking about. We understand what that infusion of blackness means, as inherently now as audiences did back in 1968. Audiences therefore may feel something traumatic at the image of a black man being shot by a police officer or someone police coded after surviving a zombie horde. But does that mean that the film is inherently trafficking in black trauma? That's the question I kind of want to talk about. Horror featuring and created by black people always has to do this dance of being a horror film while also pulling from black experiences to make the characters and stories more compelling and specific. At the same time, there is also the reality of living in an age where the brutal abuse of black bodies has become even more part of our mainstream and people know don't necessarily want to see that all the time when looking for escapism in horror. And black people have said that they are looking for black media that exists without black trauma. As a fan of black media and horror, I have found this conversation to be an interesting one. In a genre like horror where issues of race, gender, sexuality, and class have always been part of the framing of horror, I think it's interesting to ask, what is the line between black trauma and black horror? How much of our own history are we allowed to put into these stories? And how do we communicate our different boundaries to each other within community without trying to harm or judge? After all, what is traumatic to one person might not be to someone else. I don't have all the answers. This video is not intended to, to shame people who feel one way or another, but it is me going through and having worked through my own thoughts on this as someone who, loves horror, but is often exhausted by seeing the brutal treatment of black bodies in real life and wondering how it does fit into my love of a genre that loves to traffic in brutality. It's brutal out here. Let's start by defining some terms for general needs. The American Psychology Association describes trauma as, quote, an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headaches or nausea. Racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress, RBTS, refers to the mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racist bias, ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. Any individual that has experienced an emotionally painful, sudden and uncontrollable racist encounter is at risk of suffering from a race-based traumatic stress injury. Trauma responses vary. And as audience members, we all have our own limits of how much we want to go into any subject matter. For many, the appeal of film is escapism. Even in horror, where so many people often feel separated from the central dangers presented in the films, especially your typical slashers. That being said, due to the gendered aspect of the genre, you do have protagonists face things like stalking, sexual harassment, sexual assault, gaslighting, and sometimes even death from a romantic partner. Rule number one, never trust the love interest. Those traumas, those human dangers are transformed into fictional villains that can be overcome, but it plays on the dangers of human anxiety, especially if you are a marginalized gender. Because horror is in many ways the genre of otherness, 
that takes many forms. As someone who is personally triggered by hangings, it is hard to go into any kind of media and avoid it. It's usually there for dramatic effects. Even in PG-13 made for television works, it can show up. One of the hardest things about dealing with trauma or any kind of PTSD is that you don't always know when you're going to have to navigate it. You're not aware of what's gonna trigger you or when it's gonna happen. I remember having a very, very violent reaction to the way the unaliving was handled in the most recent A Star Is Born. It had never Never been depicted that way before. I was always aware that the male of interest dies and sometimes he dies by walking into the water or drowning, but I didn't affect, but I didn't expect how they handled it and it triggered my SI horribly. I just was sitting in the theater like shaking the whole time and it was really hard because I didn't expect to have that happen in a film about, you know, the rise and fall of Lady Gaga's you know, hot body girl. And in some ways horror is a safe space for me because I go into it expecting to see images that may make me uncomfortable. I expect to be scared or disturbed and that knowledge of coming into it on a kind of alert on some level allows me to give myself permission to cover my eyes and be visibly upset and kind of be in comfortable alarm if that makes sense. It is feeling like I am allowed to expect something to happen and I can prepare myself to it. It's the freedom to be afraid, to be uncomfortable and no one's going to shame me or feel weird about it because we're in a space where we're all reacting to something. And for me, I kind of find that kind of releasing, cathartic, a, a word that will be used quite often in this video. And so I think that when it comes to horror, that catharsis is so important, but it's also very key to what makes the genre work. <laughs> Horror as a genre is eternal. From cautionary fairy tales to religious visions of death, you know, so much in Revelations is very scary. <laughs> there has always been a genre of storytelling meant to unnerve and thrill. There are stories of people being raised from the dead across many faiths, men being torn apart for looking at the wrong goddess titty. You know who you are. <laughs> in Western literary history, we can probably trace horror as a genre in text back to The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole. In terms of horror films, I, I would argue that Birth of the Nation, which is the first real film, is a work of propaganda horror, but I've got enough to cover today without getting into that. But most film academics would probably say that the German expressionist film Nosferatu is the first. It's supposed to be getting remade by Robert Egger soon. Daddy is working. He is so good. I just rewatched The Vivitch recently and that shit slaps. Horror often plays on the anxieties and superstitions within the audiences of its time. Your haunted houses, your zombies, your home invaders, the IRS. I'm crazy enough to take on Batman, but the IRS, no, thank you. I think if we take the Rob Marshall quote, when movement isn't enough, you dance, or when speaking isn't enough, you sing, to the horror equivalent, it's when trauma, fear, and paranoia link up it becomes a horror movie. Wes Craven said of his horror film, The People Under the Stairs, that he came up with the plot after a new story came about two black robbers breaking into a house in Santa Monica. The police went and discovered that the owners had been keeping their children locked up in the home for years. It was just one of those stories that struck me with such irony, he said. Everybody feeling that the black people breaking into the house was the worst thing imaginable, and there you have this middle-class perfect family with a terrible secret. Modern horror, and by that I mean horror made from the 70s onward, kind of separate from the Hitchcock era of like suspense horror, is about turning fear into reality. If we look at the biggest slash icons of our time, your Jason Voorhees, your Michael Myers, Ghostface, Freddy Krueger, we can see very much white suburban anxiety getting their mascots from people inside those communities or peripheral to it, addressing it in these films. I'm not including Chucky and Pinhead, because they are gay icons and are doing their own thing, babes. And also I think that Chucky is just on a different level now that it's like, can we say, is it about consumerism? 
probably but he's just living his best life shout out to tiffany jason Voorhees, my sweet boy is rare in the horror bad guy pool because he was a victim before becoming a killer he's not the original villain in the friday the 13th series it's his mom patricia Voorhees, something that you would know if you watched scream name the killer in friday the 13th jason 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 i'm sorry that's the wrong answer. Listen, it was Jason. I saw that movie 20 goddamn times. Then you should know Jason's mother, Mrs. Voorhees, was the original killer. Jason didn't show up until the sequel. Jason was a mentally disabled kid who was left unsupervised by his camp counselors and almost drowned, but was assumed to have drowned uh, before the big cliffhanger moment at the end of the, the first Friday the 13th film. When you look back at the making and design of Jason as a character, there's a lot of ableism in both, which is kind of uncomfortable, especially because initially there wasn't as much, but it kept getting added in more and more as the film progressed. But his death happens and takes place at a summer camp, a place that teens and kids are supposed to feel safe and secure from danger, which makes both his death traumatic in universe, but then the subsequent death of all the camp counselors even worse. They're supposed to be safe here. You're supposed to be able to send your kids to summer camp and get them back. And the idea that they could not come home is a visceral suburban nightmare. Michael Myers is the product of kind of serial killer anxiety of the 70s and the way in which mental illness was blamed as the rationale for people like that. Carpenter tells this story of meeting this 13 year old in a mental institution who gave him a quote schizophrenic stare. This idea that you have these good little children, good little white kids specifically, who could potentially be born evil and harm their parents is this kind of bad seed suburban nightmare. Where is Michael attacking? the suburbs. Who is he attacking? Nice white kids and families. He is disrupting the family unit. You have Freddy Krueger who is a child and child killer in the suburbs killed by parents trying to take violence into their own hands. You have Ghostface who in his first incarnation which is both Stu and Billy because for some reason people want to just give Billy Loomis all the credit. Stu is there. Stu is killing it. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. And I have ideas for Scream 7. Call me. The OG Ghostface gaslighters and murderers in the suburbs. Are you, are you catching why I keep saying the suburbs? There's a reason why the subgenres that they always go to, duh, hood. What's up, ninjas? The, fuck? the disruption of the illusion that crime, assault, murder, sexual assault, comes from an urban world and is instead bred within the suburbs itself is white horror. We just don't call it that. And I highlight all of this before getting into black trauma and black horror, because I think it is essential to understand all good horror takes elements of collective unconscious anxiety and weaponizes it in a way to make audiences deal with it in their face in an interesting and compelling way. All good horror does that. What bad horror does is take that trauma and beat us over the head with it. It's Twitter horror. Why have a nuanced subtextual driven story when every shot and frame can be a thesis statement? The city cuts off a community and waits for it to die. Then they invite developers in and say, hey, you artists, you young people, you white, preferably or only, please come to the hood, it's cheap. And if you stick it out for a couple of years, we'll bring you a Whole Foods. Author and educator Tana Reeve Du has been quoted as saying, black history is black horror. There have been a few TikToks that talk about how a lot of the really popular dystopian works are just, what would it be like if things that happened to marginalized people happened to white people instead? And I think that is just so real. And it always makes me think back to this quote of like how the marginalized experience is just taken you know, removed from all of its cultural context and just kind of like put into like the Hunger Games. I hated horror when I was a kid. My older sister worked in a Halloween shop and uh, one day my dad took me to visit her and the store was covered in like wall to wall masks of like serial killers from movies and monsters. And I was like Snow White in the forest. I was like, <laughs> I bucked out of there. I I didn't really 
enjoy horror movies until I watched The Craft as a teenager. The Craft is about four girls in like an LA Catholic school that turn to witchcraft in order to deal with their own personal issues and they get a lot of power, get revenge on their enemies, but they end up being torn apart because the third act of the craft is bad and I'm so sorry that you're hearing that for the first time here. And I remember what really attracted me to the entire film anyway was Rochelle being played by Rachel True casting a revenge spell on a racist bully and I thought that's amazing. Oh god look there is a pubic hair in my brush. Oh no wait wait that's just one of Rochelle's little nappy hairs. I drink of my sister's. And I ask for the ability to not hate those who hate me, especially racist pieces of bleach blonde shit like Laura Lizzie. And I hated that they made her feel guilty for that. Like, no, Laura can fucking eat it. Why are you doing this to me, Laura? Do you think you're funny? You really want to know why? Because I don't like Negroids. <laughs> There was something cathartic about seeing that even if it was only for a moment. Carrie is one of my favorite books and movies of all time. I think it's one of Stephen King's best. And it's about, you know, religious trauma, fat phobia, child abuse, bullying, and the revenge murdering of all the people at prom is just the added little seasoning to this story you know it's like it's already good I know that I'm grown and I know I should evolve past it but whenever it gets ready for for Sissy Spacek her eyes go wide and you just see her closing all them doors it's just like boom 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 I'm just like get them black that's what you get when you fuck with Carrie the truth of everything that she goes through makes the horror cathartic because it triggers our idea of spiritual justice and that is what makes any kind of marginalized focus horror good we can cite a lot of films that have crafted black horror especially in the modern era but the real starting point i feel is worth looking at for now is jordan peele's get out Invasion of the Body Snatchers with a dash of guess who's coming to dinner. A concept that people need to stop trying to remake. You cannot remake guess who's coming to dinner. It's very specific. It's written in a certain period and it's good for a reason. I think it's imperative to highlight that while Get Out is a film that addresses many layers of the Black American and larger Black diasporic experiences and transforms those into subtext that inform the horror that have all these images and moments that touch on realities that are universal to Black diasporians, what really matters about Get Out is that it's a good movie. It is funny. Chris, you gotta get the fuck up out of there, man. You in some eye-wide shut situation. Leave, motherfucker. It is rewatchable. It only gets more relevant as time has gone on, the hallmark of a great film. More importantly, Peel understands the difference between using historical black anxieties as inspiration for horror and throwing trauma at the screen in order to get a visceral response, an easy visceral response. Peel has spoken out about changing the original ending of Get Out. In earlier versions, Chris is arrested by the police rather than being saved by his TSA bestie. And he said about this change, people needed a release and a hero. I wrote this movie in, um, in the Obama era and uh, we were in this, we were in this post-racial lie. By the time um, I was shooting it, it was quite clear that the world had shifted. Racism was um, being dealt with. People were woke and people needed a, a release and a hero, which is why I changed the ending and had Rod show up at the end. And that is why he's here. That is why he's here. And the rest of y'all are, are trying to find y'all way up there. That catharsis is so important. And what ends up being missing from movies like a promising young woman is this idea that a downer ending always speaks to a, a truth and a visceral justice. I know I've already talked about it on a video. Since Get Out, other black woke horror has come out and woke horror in general made by people 
who I think don't actually understand horror, in my humble opinion, create these narratives that forget to also be a story. Antebellum, which I have also covered, had a weak script and felt like an AU of the village by M. Night Shyamalan about a black woman who wakes up in a slave plantation. Uh, it could have been interesting. It could have been great. It could have had some deep kindred surrealism. And instead, it's a boring, uninteresting, unimaginative film that falls apart logically the moment you think about it too hard. And because the film is boring, you do think about it. You have Lovecraft Country, which was a massive mixed bag that I don't think ever got better past the first few episodes. And the way it added so much more violence against marginalized bodies always felt less powerful than what the show wanted us to feel. It also didn't address colorism or fat phobia or anything. It just kind of just vibed all the way through and thought that we wanted to see black men in, in packed violence on other marginalized bodies for some godforsaken reason. I just, it was doing the most. And I think the real moment that started moving this black trauma horror conversation towards what it is today and create this really need to separate trauma and horror for some black audiences was them. Pretty nice, huh? Bigger than I looked in the pictures. Them was a horror anthology series created by Little Martin and produced by Lena Waith. I should refill this. The show is about a black family during the second great migration that moves from North Carolina to Los Angeles into a white neighborhood that is essentially a racist hellmouth. And I think this was the show that made a lot of black audiences think. What are we doing here? What is the point of taking actual historically based trauma and putting it in these shows where we are supposed to just watch black people get brutalized over and over again to prove narratives and highlight things that we already know? It's like, let's just take the subjects of racism and just make it racism. And it's like, There are horrific stories about black families that attempted to integrate into white suburbia and playing off that theme of suburbia is evil. Great instinct. The whites do it. The No. No. All right, I'm just gonna hold it. The whites do it. However, you must remember something that I think is very key. <clears throat> the catharsis is for black people. To quote from Michael Blackman's BuzzFeed article from 2021, that's what viewers get with them, a stale retelling of how race operates in the US. Although there are supernatural elements at play, many of which were so convoluted I really did not understand what was going on, this kind of terror takes a back seat to the explicit racism, which operates unoriginally so as the real horror. Henry, a World War II veteran who has PTSD, battles the inequalities of being a black man in the workforce, simultaneously undervalued and held to a higher standard than his white colleagues. Lucky deals with insecurity about motherhood, which are exacerbated by her interactions with her white neighbor. Ruby struggles with being the only black girl in the school, a feeling that soon devolves into self-hate. And Gracie, the youngest daughter, faces a problem most common in the horror genre, seeing specters that her parents can't see. In several instances, the show seems to think it is going for depth, when in reality it's just reinforcing trauma. There is a scene of such gratuitous violence that I considered turning it off. It was the clearest indication that the show conflates black trauma with horror. The shocking moment lazily combines two torturous events happening simultaneously. It's a cheap way of pushing the plot forward and unnecessarily dumps even more grief onto the black family. Soon after the white characters who commit the crimes disappear, with no explanation of their reasoning for acting in such a manner. It's a giant yikes. I don't want to see endless scenes of black bodies being brutalized in order to make a point about racism. There can be an exciting incident. We can have stakes. We can have an underlying tension, but we don't need constant painful reminders of historical truths. We do not need to see black bodies on screen being brutalized to be reminded of the brutality of racism, especially if your audience and who you're attracting this thing for is other black people. 
black experiences in horror have always existed but now that black horror has become prestige along with elevated horror somehow people forgot about the need to be entertaining that the shit gotta be good i don't want to be traumatized for no goddamn reason i expect violence i expect a little bit of maiming i expect a little bit of torment but i want something to move me after that i don't love the new Candyman for this reason it has so many lines in it where it feels like it is telling me the black experience the way someone on twitter would it was the project's it's affordable housing that had a particularly bad reputation. You would never know. Yeah, because they tore down and gentrified the shit out of it. Translation, white people built the ghetto and then erased it when they realized they built the ghetto. Because let's go back to the suburbs. Do they feel the need to explain whiteness to us? It can be hard within its own culture just casually because it is the norm. Its specificity has been normalized and our normal can be specific as well. We can be specific casually the way they do because at this point, they gotta fill in the fucking blanks like we did. You think I knew about meatloaf on my own? No, I learned. <laughs> That's part of why I love The Blackening. Shout out to Tim Story, director of the Fantastic Four movie and Rise of the Silver Surfer, black movies. I said it, I like those movies. And yes, I know that The Blackening is more of a black comedy horror than a horror film, but I think fundamentally it understands how to play with expectations and tropes while being fun about knowing how to be black for itself and expecting that to just go for it. In your predicament, the black character is always the first to die. I will spare your lives if you sacrifice the person you deem the blackest to me. The blackest? It don't even make sense, the blackest. That is so subjective. But see, Shanika, she say nigga the most. Nigga! See? But that's not the point. The point is y'all can't pick me. I'm gay. Oh, oh. you always No, no, and just like my homophobic family member says, gayness is just whiteness wrapped up in a bunch of dicks, and today, I agree. Black is cool. People want to be us while they hate us because they're haters. But black people, especially black Americans, are the epicenter of cultural cool, okay? It, it's it, it, the black Americans, the Jamaicans and Nigerians and the black Britons, we're running this shit. So why are we trying to, they want to be us so badly. Why are we trying to, why are we have to explain it? If anything, we should make it harder for them because they're, they've learned too much. I remember I was going out with a white guy once and he knew too many black movies and I thought, did we, did we let them out? He knew about fucking that Martin Lawrence movie where he is a the jewel thief and hides a diamond in like a bank or something. And I remember thinking to myself like, did we, did we let white people watch those movies? I was in confusion. It's nothing to do with the plot. I'm sorry. That was a tangent. Fundamentally, the story has to be worth our pain, worth the pain our characters are dealing with. Otherwise, it's just harmful. I also think it's important to realize that while social media has made seeing images of violence against black bodies travel faster than ever before, it doesn't mean that images like that didn't exist before. There used to be postcards of lynching. They were not acts of violence that people were ashamed of. Violence of that nature and the dismissal of it because of the race, ethnicity, and religion of those who were being lynched is already part of our collective history. And that's why we should be careful when repurposing those images only to shame a white audience into getting racism because they should not be the priority. Catharsis and horror is for the victim, not the perpetrator. Nope. I was given some constructive feedback from a friend and a colleague that I don't put enough of myself into my videos. And I do think that recently, as I've kind of become a little bit more popular, I've been trying to have some level of separation between princess, the person, and princess, the person who comes and curates herself and puts on amazing eyeliner for you guys out of this out of a sense of self-preservation and to maintain some emotional balance but I do want to start giving a little bit more of me you know within reason because I barely want to be mean these days anyway as I was working on this video I was thinking about when I was little probably about like eight or nine my mother was watching some history channel special about the Ku Klux Klan this is back when they used to actually have history on there and they showed an image of a lynched black boy. It instantly made me think of my younger brother and 
I cried and I was like, mom, why they hate us? What did we do? And it was like the first time that I really, really remember having an image that connected to racism that I had heard my parents talk about with an image on screen and it sticks with me. It has always stuck with me. It is probably the moment that I think, it was one of the many awakenings of my consciousness as a black person um, that I think fully was formed when Trayvon Martin was murdered. I think those traumas activate something in your brain and a sense of understanding that can be important as an artist to think about and have mindfulness of, especially for those of us who do want to create art that can touch on many levels of those experiences. But there's also responsibility with that knowledge of understanding that like, it was still harmful and painful to see. And there has to be an ability to understand the needs of your audience sometimes goes before the desire to shock them into your thesis statement. Does that make sense? You know, the history of lynching in America is a horror story in itself. And knowing about black suffering from around the diaspora is something that fuels me and as someone who loves the works of Octavia E. Butler and Toni Morrison, I know that there is a way to blend black trauma into black horror, but that does not mean that in order to incorporate those images that we start thinking that just putting black pain on screen means you're saying something inherently profound. Pain may fuel art, but it doesn't make something inherently art. It also needs to be said that as black people, we are also allowed to feel differently about how much of our historical pain we want to put in to our consumption and receive back. I know some people who do not like Kindred and Octavia Butler's work because they find her concepts very bleak and upsetting and disturbing. And that's okay because we have room for everything and there should be more of everything. We need more black slashers. We need more black alien versus predator style movies aka beauty and the beast for the real ones we need more variety and i think in many ways the desire to see non-traumatic black films also just stems from the fact that it is exhausting that whenever we have black prestige films of any of any genre it's either about slavery, even though I do think that we don't have that many movies about slavery, which I've talked about before. It's also the only time that, you know, it takes place in the past. It's the only time that studios feel inclined to cast dark skinned black people. You know, if the movie takes place before 1989, they will have dark skinned characters. If after, then paperback's coming right back out, which is why we have been saying forever we need to bring back the rom-com prestige rom-com revival 2024 rom-coms used to win oscars so i would say that when it comes to black horror and black trauma everyone feels differently everyone's allowed to feel differently and what matters is how much the art that you are creating and producing wants to speak to its black audience with affection you know truth doesn't have to always be brutal Prestige Rom-Com Revival 2024, let's go! I am so excited to finally, finally, finally be able to share that on Nebula, on November 22nd, I will finally be launching the first two episodes and maybe three, I'm aiming for three, but I have two done of Anime Court. I know you guys have been waiting super patiently for this. Um, I'm really excited about it. I really wanted it to be like three really balanced episodes. So it's like a sweet one, like a very light one about Spy X Family, a little bit more discoursey, thought out one with Yasha Hime, which... I gotta tell you, it was a lot to put together because just more so trying to hit every note. And then the third one, which is kind of like my little bit more uh, fun one, is about uh, that ass whooping that Tamari gave Ten Ten in Naruto because that moment lives in my brain rent-free. And I just think that like 
It needs to be discussed. And we are going to make it a monthly experience where there will be at least one to two videos each month. Nebula is the online streaming service that is home to some of your favorite online creators, including myself, Be Kind Rewind, Broey Deschanel, and many others. With your subscription to Nebula, you'll also get access to Nebula classes, podcasts, and all the other extra goodies. My own videos appear unedited on Nebula, including the one you're watching right now, because... YouTube be censoring. If you sign up using the link below, you can support me directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off annual plans, as little as $2.50 a month. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on the other side. Yeah.